Welcome to day 53 of our scripture reading and daily encouragement. Today we're going to cover Numbers chapter 26 and 27. Then we're going to finish up Mark chapter 8 by covering verses 22 through 38. Then we're going to hit Mark chapter 9 verse 1. So as we pick up in Numbers, God is having them record all the names of the men who are able to go to battle. So he's redoing the census, and they're preparing to go to battle against their enemies to take the promised land. A lot of time has passed since the last census. Some things have happened. Uh, Many people have died off. The earth has swallowed up some people. Some snakes have taken out some people. A plague's taken out some people. So it's kind of like, hey, let's regroup and see where we are on people. And it says... As they're taking the census, it says not one person on this list had been among those listed in the previous census or the previous registration, except for Caleb and Joshua. If you remember from a few days ago, when God said, none of this generation will go into the promised land except for Caleb and Joshua, because they didn't lose their hope, they didn't lose faith. When they went and scouted out the promised land. So now we've advanced to the point where everyone has died off in that generation. God is taking a new census of who's going to get to go into the promised land. Who the warriors are going to be. And not a single person on this list had been among those listed previously. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Now we know from a previous scripture or previous days. Encouragement that Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. But God did allow him to climb a mountain and see the land. Here's the land they're going to get. And God tells him, Moses, you're going to die before these people enter the promised land. And so Moses begs God to choose a new leader. And I'm going to pick up in verse 16 of Numbers 27. He says, O Lord, you are the God who gives breath to all living creatures. See, even though Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land... Even though he knew his mistakes had kept him from there, he was still obedient and reverent to God. He says, O Lord, you are the God who gives breath to all creation. Please appoint a new man as leader for this community. Give them someone who will guide them wherever they go and will lead them into battle so the community of the Lord will not be like sheep without a shepherd. I just think it's incredible to point this out for Moses. Moses wasn't perfect. Moses, there was a consequence to his disobedience where he wouldn't enter the promised land. The people had rebelled against God and Moses so many times. But we see a very faithful man still honoring God and still concerned about those sheep. He was still concerned about the Israelites. How many times had those sheep bitten him, (laughs) run away? Um, How many times had they disobeyed, but he still was concerned about them? Joshua was chosen to be that leader, and we're going to see in the next couple of chapters where Joshua leads them well into the promised land. But I really want to focus on encouragement this morning. If you are a leader, and God is asking you to lead people, but it's tough, because maybe they are being rebellious. Maybe they turn on you when you've done nothing wrong. I want you to gain encouragement here. We see this man, Moses, and again, we see he's been through so much in these 40 years. But he still remains faithful to the Lord, reverent to the Lord, and he still is concerned about the people that he's shepherding. And I want you to gain encouragement from that. No matter what happens, don't lose your reverence, don't lose your hope, don't lose your respect for the Lord. And no matter what your people do to you, you are still their shepherd. Still lead them well and be concerned about their future. As we transition over into Mark... Mark chapter 8, Jesus, we pick up where Jesus is healing a blind man. And I think it's pretty cool here. Jesus heals him, so Jesus takes him out of the town. Jesus arrives at the town. They beg him to heal this blind man. He takes the blind man out of the town, takes him out of the village. He heals him, so now he can see, and Jesus tells him, do not go back. Don't go back to your town. And I think there's something for all of us here. If Jesus heals you from something, don't go back to what you've known. See, that, that's what the whole problem with the Israelites. The Israelites couldn't accept what was coming new, what God had planned for them, this promised land, because all they could do is look at their current circumstances 
and want to go back to what was familiar and what they knew. Even if it was torture, even if it was slavery, they just wanted to go back to what was normal. And I think so many times that happens to us. Jesus will deliver us from a situation or from an addiction or from some pain or from a relationship. I could go on and on. But then when we get into the new thing, it feels uncomfortable. It's, it's unknown territory. It's a little bit of the wilderness. And either after we go to the promised land or before we get to our promised land, we want to go back to what was familiar. We want to go backwards. And Jesus is telling him, I'm going to heal you, but don't you go back. Because that's all you know is this, this despair place. This place where you sat unhealed with all these other people that had no hope. Don't go back there. You go do new things. And I think that needs to be an encouragement for us today. I'm going to say it again. If Jesus has healed you, if he's delivered you, if he's gotten you out of a situation, relationship, whatever it may be, a job, whatever, career, don't let the unknown of the future entice you to go backwards. Don't go back to that village. Don't go back to that town. Don't go back to what you've known and what's familiar. Go forward into what God has promised for you, even when there's unknowns there. As we carry on in Mark, same as in Matthew, we see the story where Jesus says, Who do the people say I am? And ultimately, Peter says, You're the Messiah. Four verses later, in Matthew, I think it was five verses later, but in Mark, it's four verses later, Jesus is is, is is saying, Get away from me, Satan, to Peter. So Peter says, You are the Messiah. Four verses later, Jesus is saying, Peter, get away from me, Satan, because you don't understand God's plan. See, Peter was trying to wrap his arms around a better plan. Jesus, you're here with us. Your miracles, this work you're doing, the change. Jesus knew there was a bigger plan, but Peter could only see the present. He could only get his arms around his plan. And he couldn't understand that Jesus had a bigger, better plan. And I think this needs to be encouragement for us all. Many, many, many times we don't fully understand God's plan. We don't know where God's taking us. We don't understand. It's new territory. But we don't need to try to wrap our arms around what the plan should be and restrict what God's plan is and what he, what he can do. And then Jesus finishes this up saying, you want to follow me? You want to follow me? Give up your selfishness. Take up your cross and follow me. I want to spend a minute there. He said, give up your selfishness. Okay, that's hard enough. Then he says, take up your cross. To us, the cross is sort of a sign of victory. It's a sign of what Jesus went through. It's a sign of Christianity. But for them at that time, that cross was a symbol of torture. That was a torturous death for people to hang on a cross back then. See, they didn't have that little cross they wear around their neck on a necklace or or wear proudly on their t-shirt that shows they're a Christian. They could only see that cross as a basically torture device. So think about what Jesus says. It's the greatest sales pitch in history, right? (laughs) Give up your selfishness. Take up your torture execution weapon and follow me. See, that's the problem is many of us buy into Christianity because we hear about the blessings and the promises and those are all there. But we don't see this part where Jesus says it's going to be tough. Is A, it's tough to give up your selfishness. B, you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be torture. There's going to be bad things that happen to you because of following me. C, you have to actually follow me and do what I say. So sometimes there's sacrifices. Sometimes there's persecution. Sometimes it's tough. Yes, there are many blessings that come out of it when you help someone in their life and you see the the life change they have. There are many blessings that can come out of your giving. There are many blessings that can come from serving Him. There's joy and all the fruits of the Spirit. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a sacrifice. Verse 36, he says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So Jesus is saying, This is going to be tough to follow me. You got to give up the worldly things, but it will save your soul. And do not be ashamed of me in front of man. 
or I'll, I will be ashamed of you when my father sends me back. I hope you were encouraged today and I hope you have a great day.